at that point, Gollum had already kind of been designed, but then more thought had gone into it. It's like, well, why don't it would make sense to make Gollum look more like Andy since he's playing Spiegel. One day you get this this call, let's say, and it's uh, some guy from New Zealand says his name is Pete and he goes, uh, I want you to work on this little movie that I'm doing. It's uh, it's called Lord of the Rings, and I'd uh, like you to be a part of my makeup team. <laughs> so, what goes through your mind at a, with a, after a conversation like that? I mean, Lord of the Rings. Well, to, just to jump back a little bit, I mean, because what had happened was um, this was back in about 1996 or 97, I think it was, and I was working at a company called K and B Effects owned by Howard Berger, Greg Nicotero, and, and Bob Kurtzman. And uh, I was working on a movie called Spawn, um, and uh, Todd McFarlane's Spawn. Right. And, um, Michael J. White, like, right? It was, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and uh, Michael played uh, was played Spawn. And um, and so Howard hired me to, uh, to sculpt the suit uh, along with my friend Bill. And um, so we sculpted the suit, and then Howard one day came over and he said, um, hey, I've got a, a couple of friends coming from, uh, from this place called New Zealand, and um, they're, 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 they do special effects, and they have a company out there called Weta. I said, Weta? Well, that's weird, you know. And he said, well, they're coming out because um, they're looking to recruit people to take them back to work on, on a remake of King Kong. I said, King Kong? They're going to remake that? I said, who's, who's directing that? And he said, well, Peter Jackson. I was like, didn't know who Peter was. And, um, and, uh, and he said, look, you know, they're looking for people with, with specialty skills and stuff. And one of my, my uh, skills was always uh, painting, like designing the paint schemes for characters and creatures and the makeup and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I did a lot of sculpting as well. But if I had a choice, I'd probably be more uh, painting than, than sculpting. Um, but anyways, so he said, look, they're going to come in a few weeks and they know they, they know of your work and the shows that you've done before. And you're kind of what, what they're looking for. And they want to, you know just have a chat with you. And I said, sure, sure. So a few weeks went by and they came over and this is when I met uh, Richard Taylor and his, and his wife, Tanya, Tanya Roger. And um, it's one of those things is like, you know, you know, like when you meet somebody for the first time, you know, it's like, you just, you, you hit totally hit it off and you're going to be friends forever. You know, kind of like you and me, Hey, no. but it's, uh, <laughs> but it's like, and we totally hit it off and we just, you know, we, we totally geeked out and talked about movies and that kind of stuff. And they told me about the stuff that they had been doing because they had been working on a TV show called uh, Hercules and Xena, uh, those shows uh, in, in New Zealand, and which I loved watching those shows. I just I never realized who did the effects and that kind of stuff. Anyways, they said, they said look, we're going to be doing a, a remake of, of King Kong. And, you know, because of your skills of painting and stuff, and that's one of the things that we're kind of, you know, we're okay with, but we're, we're, we want, we'd like to learn a bit more about it. So, you know, would you be interested in coming out and, you know, maybe bringing your skills to us and teaching us the different materials that you use and, and your techniques and that kind of stuff? And it was like, it's like, uh, yeah, but, you know, the thing was I, was, I was quite happy in L.A., so I'd been there for quite a few years now, and I was I kind of made my little niche in there, and I was quite happy. And I wasn't much of a traveler or anything. And I said, "Well, so where where is this place, New Zealand? How how far is how long is it on the plane?" And Richard goes, "Oh, it's like I said. Well, do you know where Australia is?" I said, "Well, it's yeah, quite a ways down there." He says, "Well, we're we're close to Australia." So, anyways, so time went on. And I finished up with Spawn, and I had gone on to work with Patrick on Godzilla. And um, so we were about three quarters of the way through Godzilla, and um, I get a phone call from uh, from Richard, and he said, um, he said, look, um, you know, we got some, you know, bad news. Unfortunately, the studios have decided to pull the plug on Godzilla. I'm uh, uh, sorry, on King Kong, because because you guys are doing Godzilla, and Rick Baker at the time was doing Mighty Joe Young. And the studio said, you know, we don't want another big ape, you know, terrorizing the city and stuff. So they pulled the plug on it. And I said, ah, oh, shit. I said, well, but Richard said, he says, but uh, Peter has another project um, that uh, he wants to get off the ground and we'd still love to bring you out for it. And it was interesting because uh, um, I think through the grapevines, I'd heard through little murmurings that it was going to be uh, the Lord of the Rings. And so I asked him about it. And he says, I can't tell you. And I said, I think it's Lord of the Rings, isn't it? And he goes, I can't tell you. So anyways, it turns out that it was. And uh, he said, look, why don't you come out for uh, for three months 
and see see how you like working with us and how we like working with you. And if it works out, well, then, you know, we can kind of continue the relationship and continue working. And if it doesn't work out, well, then, hey, look, you got a free trip out to, to New Zealand and got to see, uh, you know, the workshop and that kind of stuff. And so um, so kind of finished up with uh, with with Godzilla and Patrick and um, uh, came out here, uh, you know, for the for the first time. And by that by that point, uh, Richard and his team had been working on the designs and stuff for for a, uh, a couple months, a few months actually. And he had you know the great artist, the local artist there, um, but he also had brought over Alan Lee and John Howe. You know, for people who don't know who they are, they're you know probably Tolkien's most you know influential people as far as illustrating a lot of Tolkien's books and that kind of stuff. You know, and both incredible artists, and I've been huge fans of their artwork you know for years and years. And they were there at the workshop, so I got to meet them, and it was just like, wow, this is incredible. And I got to see a lot of the designs that they had been doing. And the designs, I'll never forget, the designs are so cool and so fresh and different, you know, stuff that I had never seen before. And what I mean by that is, like, you know, in, in L.A., if I saw a film and saw the makeup effects and the creatures, I could usually tell what shop did it, because each each shop puts their own kind of stamp and look on it, you know, mm. uh, which is a good thing. And uh, but this time it's like the stuff was so different and so new. I, I, you know, it was it had its own look. You know, it was a uh, it was like, you know, they designed something that had never been seen before. And um, so it was it was really exciting for me to be able to design the paint schemes, you know, for 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 these characters and creatures and stuff. What do you think it was that set those particular designs apart? Was it did it have something to do with the fact that they weren't maybe so influenced by what was going on on in L.A. at the time? Absolutely. I think that had a lot to do with it because they're, they're so far removed from it. I mean, literally, I mean, you know, the other side of the world kind of thing. And, um, you know, and Richard would always say it's like, you know, every now and then they, they used to get like a copy of Fangoria magazine or Cinefix. And it was like it was like gold. It's like, wow. But, you know, out, out, out in L.A., it's like, well, you just go to the newsstand and, and buy, it, you know. And uh, yeah. um, but also, you know, one of the things that um, that Peter had told everybody uh, when they were all designing the stuff. Peter said, you know, this stuff can't be fantastic, can't be fantastical. This has to be something where it's, this is a real place. This place actually existed. He said, so on one of the weapons, it's, it'll be, he said, imagine like if one of the swords that you guys have designed, if it was dug up from the earth and it was found, it's like, wow, this is a relic. And this, this actually existed in, in this place called Middle Earth. And so that's why everything had to have such a uh, realistic feel to it and, and believability. And um, and that went it went across the board to everything from the architecture um, to the designs of the, the scenery, of course, and then uh, uh, the the makeup effects and all that kind of stuff. And I remember asking Richard. I said, "So tell me what? So what, what are you guys actually doing on the film?" And Richard said, "Well, we're doing the the uh, the miniatures, uh, which they called the bigatures because they were so huge. Uh, the miniatures, um, uh, the makeup effects, the armor and or armor and weapons." and and the costumes and it was just like you guys are doing all that and he says yeah and i thought wow because because normally what would happen if, if a film like that had gone to la let's say you know one shop you know maybe rick baker would get the makeup effects you know another shop would get the armor and weapons another shop would get the costumes and it, it, it would get all get kind of split up between everybody and um and the thing with that and this is something that's interesting that i've always noticed is like when i see a film Sometimes the, all the bits and pieces don't meld together because they because they, everybody has put their own kind of stamp on it. Even though they came from one design, everybody still has their own kind of look and stuff to it. And so when you see the stuff come together on film, it actually doesn't come together. It just it looks something's off about it. Mm -hmm. But I think that's mm -hmm. one of the huge successes about Lord of the Rings. Um, besides of not just having you know, a, a great director and great design and great people working on it, but it was just everything was done under one roof. And so everything had the same kind of feel and look look to it, you know. So I think that was uh, that was a huge part of it being so successful. Great, great. And as as far as the makeup and visual effects go, I mean, I love those films. Um, my wife, she actually said when I told her that I was going to be interviewing you, she said that I must specifically tell you that she actually watched all three in one day, which I haven't even managed to do, <laughs> but she did. Um, it was such a successful movie. Without, without a bathroom break? <laughs> it left such a mark on 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 films and on the culture and everything and a big part of that film's success 
is a lot of the stuff that you've just mentioned is the visual scope. I mean, it's just so huge. And I'm sure that there was a lot of a lot of challenge and, and difficulty going into that. Can you can you describe what what that was like, especially since it was in a sense also like foreign to you? It was like you were traveling into this unknown, uh, the unknown of New Zealand. Can you describe a little bit of the challenges that you faced and was there apprehension going into the project or was it just pure excitement? It was actually, it was a little bit of everything. You know, I went into it, you know, um, feeling, especially after I saw the designs and everything, you know, I was, um, I was, I've always been quite confident, but in this case, it was just like, wow, holy shit, this stuff is really, really cool. And uh, at the same time of being very excited about it, it was just like, shit, how I, you know, I really need to step up my game and, uh, and, uh, and, and think outside the square to, uh, you know, design some, you know, color schemes uh, for these characters and creatures. Um, so that was that was a huge challenge. But uh, again, you know, working closely with all the artists and stuff and getting everybody's input, you know, was a, was another uh, huge benefit. And of course, Peter's input as well. You know, Peter used to come into the into the workshop on I think it was like on Tuesdays and Thursdays. He would come around in the morning and just to check on on stuff, all the different departments in the workshop to see what everybody was doing and give give a lot of notes and stuff. Um, but to um, to get back to your question, I mean, one of the some of the challenges that I found it was just because New Zealand is so far removed, you know, uh, from the whole scene of LA, but also uh, materials were, were a huge challenge of trying because I, I couldn't get the same materials that I was used to using um, mm -hmm. regards to the, a lot of the paints, um, the makeup and that kind of stuff. Um, a lot of it could be, could be, uh, uh, gotten and purchased from the states but it was it got to be so expensive because um it had to be shipped obviously from you know from la or wherever it was coming from and there was always that 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 huge timeline of how long it would take to actually get get the product and so tanya roger who did a lot of the at the time did a lot of the purchasing of stuff she um you know had to you know time things and uh you know to make sure that we were always stocked up with things but it was also the, the crew's responsibilities. Like, you know, when you see something getting low, you know, don't wait till it's this far down, you know, and um, and then say, oh, we need some more of that because it's going to be three weeks before we can get, you know, more product and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, everybody's responsibility to keep an eye on that kind of stuff. But yeah, but for me, it was just a lot of just getting used to not having the, the same materials that I was used to using, but also, you know, uh, making things work and using, you know, different materials and mixing different materials to get the, together to, to make them work. Um, mm -hmm. And so, and so now it's just, I've, it's, you know, it's, uh, I've gotten so used to a lot of the materials out here and the paints and things that it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty simple now. Yeah. And we can, we can still, we can still get a lot of the same materials and stuff, but again, um uh the biggest problem with the materials is probably the adhesives that we use we because we use a medical grade adhesive uh called telesis and um the telesis has to be shipped as a, as a hazardous material and so you know it can still get shipped but then you get the the hazardous cost put on top of of that material and the, the material i mean literally like a, a a bottle of telesis like this could be you know 150 dollars for that and then on top of that, with the hazardous costs, it could be another hundred dollars on top of that. And um, so, you know, this stuff was like liquid gold. You had to be so careful with it and, and use it so sparingly. Um, uh, but um, yeah, stuff like that. How much? How much of the of the actual prosthetics and and stuff? I mean, I, this is quite a long time ago. So was it was it also quite heavy? Was there a lot of CGI going on there, or was there also, was I know Peter Jackson is a, is a big fan of practical effects. So was there a lot of practical effects in in those movies? I mean, that must have also just logistically been a massive challenge on set itself, right? It was. I mean, there there's a huge amount of practical stuff, and CG was um, you know it been around, but you know it was fairly newish, especially something that hadn't really been done before is uh as a hero character such as Gollum, you know and that was going to be a real challenge and i remember when they were doing the first tests with Gollum, and when we see him in the first film in the the fellowship of the ring we see just a glimpse of him when he's he's got his hands up on these bars and you see him look into the uh look into the camera and you see like the 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 reflectiveness of his eyes and things you know the caustics and things um but that but that was because they weren't quite ready to show him yet. You know, he, they haven't worked out all the bugs on him yet. Um, but, you know, 
then of course we had you know the great Andy Circus, you know, who 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 played uh, 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 Smeagol and and Gollum. Um, I remember that we had made like a, a, a we called it the Gimp suit, <laughs> so it was basically it was like a green uh, spandex suit that that he wore uh, that um, uh, that my friend Roman Reyes uh, painted, but painted like like the muscle structure and all that kind of stuff, just so it wasn't just a green suit. Um, but you know, that was always going to be replaced. But uh, at the time, Andy was also wearing like a hood with a couple of holes cut out. And it wasn't until later on, you know, when they were thinking about it, it's like, well, this is kind of silly. Why are we covering up his face and everything? You know, we should do, we should be able to see, uh, Andy doing his acting and see, you know, what, what he's doing with his eyes and his expressions and things like that. So that's when this whole thing with uh, motion capture started coming around and, uh, and, uh, getting thought out. And um, so they, you know, they, they took the hood off and they ended up, you know, placing, putting markers and stuff on Andy's face. But uh, um, and then it was at that point, Gollum had already kind of been designed, but then more thought had gone into it. It's like, well, why don't it would make sense to make Gollum look more like Andy since he's playing Smeagol. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, a lot of design went back into it. And uh, Jamie Bez Warwick, who's a, who's a great friend and a brilliant artist at, at what a workshop did the design work on on Gollum. And um, and so it was Gollum to really become a bit more like uh, like Andy. And, um, and another friend, uh, a great friend, uh, Bay Rate was another artist who did a lot of the the facial uh, and the the digital facial uh, uh, movements and that kind of stuff. He got that kind of thing worked out on on, on Andy's performance. It was just, it was an interesting process of of seeing you know something that's so new and everything you know talking about the CG stuff and you know how far it came and you can, you can see it across the films. And then when we get into uh, you know the third film, you can see just you know how much. Uh, better his skin looks, you know, his movements, the freight, the facial expressions and things. It's uh, everything's advancing. And even to, you know, the, the, every it seems like every week, you know, the guys are coming up with something a little bit different to improve things. And even when you look at, you know, like the, the other films that we did, the Planet of the Apes, you know, uh, again, you know, Andy's great performance in that and uh, the facial movements and the, the skin textures and the fur and everything is like just unbelievable. It blows me away. Yeah, it's incredible. And, and it's, it's also to me quite a fascinating how, uh, like you were saying in Fellowship of the Rings, you, you don't really see uh, Andy Secris's face. And yet when we did finally see him, it kind of just made complete sense that they were the same person. It, it, it's amazing how much of his performance, it seemed like a perfect amalgamation of CGI prosthetics and, 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 uh, and an actor, you know, an actual performance. It wasn't just this like this, this, digital character it was a, a real performance going on there you know it was and i think you know with uh, with uh, his performance and everything it was so important for uh for the boys we'll call them the boys you know with uh with frodo and sam of having to to interact with uh, with yeah. andy it was all so physical you know and, you know with, with their fighting their grabbing and all that kind of stuff you know yeah uh, it, that's that's just one of the things that just makes it look so so real you know because it's like even though the digital golem wasn't actually there but their golem was there you know yeah. as, as andy <laughs>